Explaining entertainment, getting you ahead of the culture curve. That's what we do here each and every day. And on the best of days, we come away with a video that's a lot of fun and where all of us get to learn a little bit. Joining us to help us in this endeavor is the one and only Andrew of Legal Mindset. Welcome to the channel for the first time. It is truly an honor to have you. Hey, pleasure to be here on your channel for once, Pro. Uh, thank hey you for joining me on my channel, for also collaborating with our good friends over there across YouTube. Uh, every time I've had a conversation with you, it's been absolutely fantastic. And it's great to be talking to other professionals uh, and going on a deep dive on specifics on these cases. That's right. And today's topic, we're going to be chatting about Alec Baldwin. We're also going to be chatting about uh, the situation that just broke within the last 36 hours, let's say, about Justin Roiland the voice actor and co-creator behind the Rick and Morty TV show. We're going to be finding out, is this a situation where these two men are being treated equally, both under the law, as well as in the eye of public opinion, i.e. the media. So let's dive straight in, and we're going to learn a lot today. We're going to start off with an article from the New York Times, uh, that bastion of truth over there. This is one of your favorites, right? Oh yes, this is this is a very reliable source. They've never published anything incorrect in the New York Times. They've never had to issue any retractions. In this case, though, we it's uh, bare bones enough that they can get it right for once. So <laughs> we're going to stick with uh, the charges here, just so everybody knows. You know, it's easy to forget exactly what we're dealing with. This has been going on a long time. So if you have forgotten about the situation with Alec Baldwin and the death of Helena Hutchins, who was the uh, cinematographer for his independent movie he was working on, well, you could be forgiven because it took a long time to reach the point we are at today. Article says, uh, Alec Baldwin will be charged with involuntary manslaughter and rust killing. A gun that Mr. Baldwin was rehearsing with went off, killing the film cinematographer. The armor responsible for weapons on set also faces manslaughter charges. All right, and this, so, one I was, this is what I was looking for. It's by Julia Jacobs and Graham Bowley or Bowley. Let's hope it's Bowley for the sake of that individual. So the, in this case, uh, you have both people charged. So Alec Baldwin is charged, but you also have uh, Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, who is the armorer. The armorer is the person that's supposed to be in charge of the weapons, the props, things like that. And she is charged as well because, well, that was her duty. That was her within her uh, role, her job role. And they're charged under the New Mexico statutes with involuntary manslaughter. Now, under the first section, uh, the relevant section of uh, the homicide chapters, which is section 30-2-3 of manslaughter, there's two different types of manslaughter. There's voluntary manslaughter, which involves kind of heat of passion, a fight. Uh, if you went home and you caught your spouse cheating on you and there was a homicide in that case, that would be voluntary manslaughter. The second is involuntary manslaughter, which either is a death that you did not intend, but that either occurs in one of two scenarios, one, when you're doing something illegal, or two, when you're doing something negligent. Um, so okay, so Andrew, first question to you. I was speaking with an attorney friend of mine earlier today, and we were discussing the fact that some states have separate categories for this. So in some states, the situation is that you can either be charged with negligent manslaughter or you can be charged uh, with involuntary manslaughter. In New Mexico, are these differentiated at all or is it the same charge? Are they synonymous in New Mexico? In New Mexico, these things are rolled up together. And practically, in terms of the state of mind, uh, they're the same. It's involuntary, right? It's involuntary manslaughter. The difference is some states split these up and say, okay, involuntary manslaughter, that's when you are committing a crime, let's say, and there's a death that results from that versus negligent manslaughter, which some states break out and say, okay, you're negligent, there's a death. Those are really the only two criteria. And in New Mexico, those things are put together in the statute. They're the same thing. And the two criteria we need for Alec Baldwin to be guilty is, was there a death? Yes. And was he negligent? In the language of the New Mexico, New Mexico statute, did he act in a way that was without due caution and circumspection? That's the I question, see. bro. 
Okay, so let's read about three paragraphs into this so everybody is uh, well aware, and then we're going to break down all the ways that Mr. Baldwin messed up big time. So reading in the article, it says, For more than a year, the actor Alec Baldwin has tried to defend himself against the suggestion that he bore responsibility for the fatal shooting of a cinematographer on the set of Rust, a low-budget, that's for sure, western he was filming on the outskirts of Santa Fe, New Mexico. He told detectives he had been assured the gun he was rehearsing with that day did not contain live ammunition. Sat down for an extensive television interview, that one with George Stephanopoulos, by the way, sought indemnification from financial liability in the case, and then sued crew members on the film, claiming they, that they were responsible for handing him a loaded gun. But on Thursday, prosecutors said they would charge him with two counts of involuntary manslaughter in the killing of the cinematographer Helena Hutchins, 42, saying they believed he had a duty to ensure the revolver was safe to handle. All right, let's go through some of the very bad decisions that Mr. Baldwin decided to make that day. First of all, yes. it does not seem to me that uh, the reports about this being a prop gun are very accurate, or at least that they, they give people information that would lead them to an accurate conclusion. So... Andrew, was this or was this not a real gun that he was handed? This was a functional firearm. This was something that could be fired. In fact, there are reports that it was fired uh, earlier earlier in the production, uh, that there were other live rounds on the property. There were, I believe, five live rounds found on the property for this particular firearm. So this firearm was completely capable of firing live rounds. And if I'm not mistaken, we now know that he actually had live ammunition in one of his costumed belts is that correct that is correct so he had some of that ammunition in his possession in his immediate possession um, his defense is is that the standard practice and this is something that's been uh parroted by him and his defenders is well the standard practice is you know i'm handed a gun you know i'm told whether it's hot or cold or whatever the weapon is and I go from there. I don't need to inspect it. I don't need to look at it. I don't need to uh, engage in any of that due caution, any of that firearm safety that a normal citizen might engage with, um, or rather someone just in that same situation. Some folks have said this is uh, a situation where you need to analyze it from the lens of an actor, but we have plenty of people, including others that came out. I know George Clooney gave that famous interview now, now famous interview, saying that what he did was not uh, standard and that actors are supposed to check the weapon and supposed to show it to the person uh, that they're pointing it at. Um, these are all factors leaning against his, uh, his innocence and towards his negligence. Sure. And there are other parts of this that also, I think, lead to him having culpability. So for example, from my understanding, whenever you are on a production set, whether it is for a movie or a TV show or whatever, my understanding is that directors typically do not have actors ever point a gun at another human being, but instead they will use clever angles to make it appear as if that is happening, but that you do not point a gun at somebody. You certainly do not point a gun at a camera crew or at your cinematographer without even at least plexiglass blocking should an accident occur? Do you think that's standard practice to point a gun at somebody, Andrew? Is that, is that I, normal on a set? I mean, I have been try I had a, a debate with someone on that on my channel that um, it's not something that's necessarily required, but it, 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 seems, it seems insane to me, especially after we learned a lesson from uh, Brandon Lee, um, you know, with the sure. most famous accident during the production of The, of the Crow. Uh, one, one of the most famous firearm accidents. And you would think after that, you, there would be things you would do, common sense things you would do to prevent something like that from ever happening again, right? Putting a simple pane of uh, pane of protective glass would hurt, would work. Um, other thing, other, other methods you could take also uh, showing someone that firearm, but without telling anybody, without any notice, without any inspection, that does not seem like something that you would do even on a low budget Western film. And then the next thing that seems to have went wrong in all of this is that according to reports I've seen, and then you can verify this, you've looked into this deeply, and this is really in your wheelhouse, yes. a little bit outside of what I typically do. Who knows? Maybe in the future we'll do more of this. Hopefully not, because that would mean more celebrities are acting really stupidly. But it's my understanding that Mr. Baldwin also was 
improving, changing the scene, preparing for something that was outside the script when he did this, which occurred in a fatal shooting. Is that is that also true? Yes, that is true. He did give statements. Um, and by the way, his statements are already inconsistent, both in terms of his police statements, his uh, subsequent interviews. He has now inconsistent statements on what he was doing and how he was doing it. But one of his statements was that he was just playing around, in his words, just trying out different, yeah, that's, different hey, poses. Yeah. Andrew, was that, is that what you would have advised your client to say, that he was playing I around? I would never advise a client or anyone, or just uh, not, forget even as a lawyer, right. just as a person. I grew up in Florida. I grew up shooting. I'm a, I have a concealed carry permit. Uh, I grew up, I got a hunting certification when I was a kid in Florida. I, I have grown up with firearms. I would never advise someone, forget my legal experience, as a person who's handling firearms, even if you think it's empty, even if you're you're someone who is fairly confident handling firearms, I would not say you would play around with a firearm with other people in the room in the firing arc of the weapon. Absolutely, absolutely. It's a, an impressive combination of narcissism and stupidity, I would say, to, to come up with that kind of a, a statement after what had happened, after someone is dead. And okay, of course, so, he also he also said, by the way, Pro, let us not forget that he did say that the gun fired itself and that he did not pull the trigger. This is the same individual right. who made that comment. So that's where I'm going next. Okay, so the next point on this is that not only has he been inconsistent in what he said regarding how this came to be, but also in the uh, process that resulted in the gun firing. So he's made statements regarding the trigger. He's made statements regarding the hammer of the weapon. Is it any type of defense for him in the charge that he faces to say that he didn't pull the trigger, but perhaps he pulled back the hammer. Does that, does that help him in any way other than to show that he's not an intelligent person when it comes to guns and shouldn't have one? Well, that, that is certainly a true statement, pro absolutely without doubt that he should not be around firearms because of who he is and the fact that he is clearly careless around firearms. I would not trust him around with a firearm around me ever. But that being said, if you scroll up, there's an FBI report that did come out, which says that he conclusively did uh, pull oh, yes. the trigger right there, uh, that he conclusively pulled the trigger. So you've got evidence that he did indeed pull the trigger and that that weapon wouldn't have fired but for him doing that. And in the law, you can make presumptions. You can say, okay, you say this didn't happen, but guns don't fire themselves typically you'd have to the burden is on you to prove something rare like that if you believe this was a defective weapon that was firing itself the burden is on you because but for somebody pulling that trigger that gun would not fire that's the presumption right there's a there's a lot of uh, principles in law which presume things like that these things don't happen to themselves cars don't drive themselves oh wait well we're, we're moving well, down that direction minus elon yeah. Minus Elon, Elon's. minus Elon. But tip, typically, th there's things that we say, okay, they don't happen themselves. Uh, for example, if you were to go to the hospital and have a surgery and you find a surgical tool inside of yourself, even if there's no proof, there's no camera, video, testimony that the doctor left a tool inside of you, you can make the presumption that but for that surgery, there would not be a tool inside of you, a surgical tool inside of you. Because, well, that doesn't normally happen, right? So these are things that the law permits. And mind you, uh, I want to bring up, this is a good comment, there's a there's two suits that can be brought here. We're talking about the criminal suit, but there's also the civil suit against the production itself and Alec Baldwin as the producer, uh, Rust Movie Productions, uh, LLC. So with both of those things in mind, yes, that presumption is absolutely something that can be made both in a criminal context and in a civil context. And in order for Baldwin to make the defense that he didn't pull the trigger, he would essentially have to argue against physics itself. So it's yeah, not the best. It's not the best idea for him to go that that route. No, f physics, uh, and not just physics, engineering, common sense. It's a huge burden, and it loses all credibility. Um, but I don't think this is going to trial. I don't think Baldwin will have to testify. Okay. Well, we'll come back to the civil side of this in just a moment because there's some odd stuff about that as well. I mean, there's some really weird stuff going on on the civil side, but in terms of the uh, the legal trouble that he faces with the law and uh, criminal uh, potentiality for him, I want people to understand that it's not just that he's a foolish actor who was handed a gun and then he behaved in a way that he shouldn't. There's more to this, and it may lead to understanding why he has been charged in the first place. 
Mm -hmm. Many people don't understand that he, Alec Baldwin, is a producer on this independent movie. And what that means is that he has a larger oversight supervising role for this movie than just any old celebrity who walks in and does their job for five days and then exits. So let's read real quick. This is out of Market Realist by Catherine Underwood. And it's going to explain a little bit about this. Although the, the, the uh, article itself will explain that it's difficult to grab this information now. Gee, I wonder why. Russ Movie Productions LLC jumped into the American public's eye last October due to a tragic onset event resulting in the death of a cinematographer. Actor Alec Baldwin was the one holding the gun that killed Helena Hutchins, although it's said to have been accidental. Who owns Rust Movie Productions? The company being fined for Hutchins' death. Gee, I wonder. Here we go. Oh, this, oh do you have a guess? Do you have a guess yet? I mean, it's there. It's there in the highlight. That's why I was saying, oh, you know, of course, <laughs> uh, of course, of course, Alec is a member of that LLC. And, and by the way, you know, if it's a small production, he would want equity, right? I mean, that's something that he would want sure. as part of his protections for his earnings. Might not want the liability anymore, would you say? Uh, yes, yes. The, he wants the he wanted the equity without the liability. Unfortunately, they are now hand in hand. Okay, so let's talk about this situation now. So with this, with the fact that he had some ownership, and with the fact that he had some oversight duties, we know that things were not handled correctly when it came to safety, safety procedures. Uh, the handling of firearms and their ammunition. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the concerns that the crew had with uh, with the armorer, et cetera, on this set? Yeah, this was an extremely problematic production from the get-go. The armorer, Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, her, her father was a famous uh, armorer, was well-known in the business. Uh, and from what from what we know of Hannah, she was relatively inexperienced. The armorer- Very itself, young. Mm -hmm very young, had been on very few productions, certainly no major productions. So this was sort of her, her foot in, right? She was going to go, she'll be in a production with Alec Baldwin, and she'll move on to, to greater and bigger productions. Well, that certainly will not be the case now. This will now be probably the death knell uh, for her career, um, uh, st stopping relatively early. But there were concerns expressed throughout this production with safety. There were reports of people live firing on set. There were complaints about firearms. There were walkouts, literally walkouts, um, both over general safety and I believe also over the COVID protections because this was during the time in which the crazy corona restrictions were still in full swing. So there were multiple safety concerns which have been shown conclusively to have been brought to the attention of uh, Alec Baldwin, that he actually did have knowledge of those safety concerns. And then on top of that, it's my understanding that they were doing uh, target practice on the on the set. Yes, if that's the case, not... right? If that's the case, how could they not be deeply concerned that live ammunition could make its way into what is quote a prop gun unquote? Yeah, live firing, uh, or i.e. target practice, plinking, whatever you want to call it, uh, was reported. And I believe, based on all the reports we have, the information we have, that that is indeed valid, that they were firing on set, which in and of itself would be a violation of the rules, violation of the standard practices. So already, you've got liability on the part of the company, especially from a civil standpoint. If we're talking okay. about wrongful death suits uh, for, uh, for Halma, 100% that comes into the factor for... Uh, Alec Baldwin as part of that production. All right. Now explain for us, what about criminality? Can criminality be brought into this situation if you are a producer, if you are an owner in a company that acts in a way that results in a death? Can you be charged criminally for that? And is Baldwin being charged via his ownership or his position as an oversight slash manager of this film? Okay. I need to be very careful how I say this. The producers of the film, in and of themselves, for being producers, are not liable solely for being producers for the criminal act of involuntary manslaughter, i.e. negligent homicide. So let me say that one more time. Just because you're a producer does not mean you're guilty of involuntary manslaughter. However, 
when we're looking at Alec Baldwin specifically and whether he acted without due caution and circumspection, whether he was negligent, his role as a producer is relevant. That does go into the fact because we're go taking his standpoint. Would somebody in Alec Baldwin's position as both an actor and producer exercise more caution than Baldwin exercised under those circumstances where he knew there were safety concerns? Should he maybe have done a little bit more than the bare minimum? If he says, oh, well, I was doing the bare minimum, okay, maybe that would be all right in a production that had zero safety issues, that had a great crew, that had people that were on point, the people that weren't making any mistakes. But that's not the case here. And because he was the producer, that impacts his personal negligence in this case. So it, it applies to him and his state of mind under those circumstances. So you have to apply his role as a producer specifically for him. So there are two tiers then of levels of mistakes made by this individual, by Mr. Baldwin. Yes. Not only is he the person who pulls the gun out, he's not only the person who aims it at a human being, he's not, the, he's not only the person who pulls the trigger, but he's also the person who was supposed to be overseeing a production that's handled in a safe manner according to the standards and the protocols that you would see on any normal set, and yet on both of those levels, right, the macro and the micro, he seems to have failed. And yet, Andrew, can you believe that Hollywood was quick to wrap their arms, their proverbial arms, around Mr. Baldwin? This coming to us from Fox News, Nate Day is the author. Alec Baldwin received support from Hollywood after onset shooting. Our hearts are broken along with yours. And uh, we'll take a look real quick at just who some of these people are. We've got Nancy Sinatra. Call him, him a dear, kind man who wouldn't hurt anyone purposefully. We've got but Rosie he's not, O'Donnell. Good thing, good thing he's not charged with a purposeful murder. This is that, what people right. misunderstand about this. There is no mens rea on this, i.e. intent, fancy word lawyers use for mm -hmm. intent. There's no intent needed. Intent is not necessary. Negligence does not require intent. It requires you using less caution than you should have used under that circumstance. Right. And a great comparison would be that if you get into a vehicle and you're completely drunk out of your mind and you make it a mile down the road and then you smash into somebody and you kill them, you did not intend to kill that person. Mm -hmm. That doesn't matter. You took the steps which led to their death and you didn't have to take those steps. So Is here's that the analogous? thing. What that's absolutely analogous. And what Rose and what uh, Nancy Sinatra is saying can still be true. These things are not mutually exclusive. You could be a wonderful, dear person, sober, right? You could give money to all the orphans and the charities and do all the nice things and be the kindest person in the world. But you drink half a bottle of scotch, you get in the car, you run somebody over. That is still going to be a charge against you, a criminal charge against you, regardless of whether you went out there with the purpose of killing someone or not. That's right. And you can be a wonderful person. But if you run a movie production where safety standards are ignored and then you decide to improvise with a gun and aim it at somebody and it just so happens to go off as a result of many, many bad decisions, then that's also chargeable. Yep. All right. So we've also got Rosie O'Donnell sending love. Leslie Jordan, our hearts are broken along with yours. We've got Brooke Nader sending so much love and it keeps going. It keeps going. We've got Sherry O'Terry from Saturday Night Live sending uh, uh, stuff to him. And so Hollywood just, they, they, they just jump straight to Mr. Baldwin. I can't imagine why, although I probably can. Any thoughts on this? Any thoughts on yeah. the bias that immediately happened? And also, I'm just amazed that they didn't immediately reach out to the woman who was shot and killed. I mean, have we not been through years and years of paying very close attention to when, when women are mistreated, and yet they leapt to the defense of Alec Baldwin? Of, yes, of a of a white male, but he has the right politics. Uh, he's had the right takes on Trump. Uh, you know, no one can forget him for the SNL performances. He carried um, and, the he carried the water they wanted to be carried, right? Yes, he had the TDS they wanted him to have, um, and I think that's that's pretty much uh, par for the course with Hollywood. If you're in their camp, you're going to get their favoritism. You're going to get their opinions. And you know this list of people, uh, many of which who are frankly nobodies who haven't been relevant in a long time. But that being said, they're part of this establishment, part of this uh, cult that will back each other up regardless, no matter what. And they're, they've been part of the problem for a lot of movements. Um, when we talk about Me Too, we talk about uh, other types of criminal allegations where 
they'll come out, point a finger, and say, let's get behind this person. Think about uh, Jesse Smollett, Juicy, <laughs> Juicy Smollett, That's right. uh, as we like to joke. Everybody got behind him immediately in a similar fashion to Alec Baldwin. Turns out when things go to court, when things, you know, actually when the facts get exposed, it turns out these people are liars. Um, and many of those folks that came out there and supported liars like uh, Jesse Smollett uh, haven't ever retracted their statements. They haven't rather gone back. And folks with Alec Baldwin here, as we go closer to the trial, whether we get a trial or whether we get a plea, I want to see whether they retract these statements, uh, uh, Pro, or whether oh, they I, I, keep just, these out there. Any, any moment now, they're going to do it. Any moment. I can just feel it. But, you know, the, the cognitive dissonance is strong with these people. In, in both of these cases, you can quickly surmise that something is not right. In the case of Smollett, I mean, the, the facts, as soon as we had them within 24 hours, you could quickly go, wait a minute. This yep. doesn't make any sense at all. None of these things add up. One plus one does not equal two here. And in the case of yes. Mr. Baldwin, like we said, you have to discredit physics itself. You have to argue with the language of the universe in order for Mr. Baldwin to be right. But you know what? When you have enough hubris, I guess that's the defense that you can make. Right. You can say, hey, listen, my intent matters, even though that's not an element of the crime. And you, prosecutors, the state should treat me differently. But there was literally a statement from the prosecutor, this is special prosecutor, Andrea Reeve, who said, uh, we're trying to definitely make it clear that everyone's equal under the law, including A-list actors like Alec Baldwin. And I, and I, I really appreciate her coming out and saying that because equality under the law due process is what makes America really a fantastic country because we still have court systems that on most levels are willing to hold up due process and equal rights under the law and equal prosecution under the law. People like Alec Baldwin should not be given a pass when anybody else who's charged with this crime would end up likely serving the five years or 18 months in prison uh, that are carried with this felony level offense. Well, let it be said that the trial by jury is one of the things I think that continues to hold America together. And so kudos to the, ju the judicial system because many of the parts of, of the United States have went haywire, but at least we still have that. And also, frankly, I was surprised that Mr. Baldwin, after all this time, is now facing charges. Did this shock you that, that uh, the, the district attorney came out with this? I think they needed to make sure it was it was it was going to be pretty airtight saying look we need to have evidence if we're going to come for this guy we need to actually prove it and they needed to think about what tr what charge to bring and one of the brilliant things frankly is they brought the right charge they're not bringing the wrong charge here they're bringing the absolute right charge which is uh they're bringing charges for involuntary manslaughter which just requires showing his negligence if they're able to Andrew, show his negligence maybe we, have thought, it, we have it a death maybe. good Maybe they thought that if they waited long enough, he'd do more uh, national interviews. And uh, just, oh <laughs> man, I mean that just what a, what as, a horrible as thing. His, if I was his lawyer, I would have I would have been firing myself at that point. Oh uh, my gosh, I don't know, it was so I terrible. Have no idea what they were thinking doing that. I have no idea who advised him to do that. It was horrible advice. It was terrible advice. Um, they thought he was competent enough to do it, and I guarantee you. Well, maybe they thought that uh, George, maybe they thought old George would carry the water for him like some of these other celebrities, but, you know, it's hard to do when you're just so bad. Yeah, it's just when 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 the case is against you and you've already put your foot in your mouth, when you've already said things you shouldn't have said, it, it's a problem. It's a big problem. All right, so we talked about the civil part of this. We're going to come back to it because it's really strange. Yes. This ties into it. So this is out of Reuters, and this one is just from a few days ago to give people some understanding of how odd this is. This is from January 23rd. Rust to be completed with Baldwin in lead role, lawyer says, this by Andrew Hay over at Reuters. Western movie Rust will continue filming with Alec, Alec Baldwin in the lead role, a lawyer for the pr production said Monday, days after prosecutors said they would charge the actor in the fatal shooting of the movie cinematographer Helena Hutchins. All right, so people can go and read this a little bit more, but essentially it seems to me, uh, and, and well, actually I'll read this. Baldwin in October reached a settlement of a wrongful death lawsuit filed by the Hutchins family. That's the lady who was, who was okay, killed in this incident. So they settled that. This is a very important fact. Okay, under which Hutchins would take a production role in Rust and filming would resume this month. Let's say it again. Hutchins, this is the husband... This is the husband, the widowed husband now, 
would take a production role in Rust. Not sure if he wants the liability. I mean, maybe maybe uh, maybe Alec Baldwin will be kept away from anything uh, more dangerous than a whoopee cushion, but uh, I, I don't know. I guarantee you there's an indemnity clause in there, and I guarantee he's been indemnified from any – I mean, you know, as a, as a lawyer, be. yeah, there's got to be – especially there's a wrongful death suit in there, so he's probably had a lawyer on that one. There's got to be an indemnity from any litigation uh, regarding this. Uh, I think the production side is to keep it respectful and so they can say that it was done with the blessing of – uh, Halna Hutchins, because it seems very disrespectful to Halna to finish this production. So I get that a family member might want his wife's final endeavor to come to fruition. Right. But at the same time, I don't. I mean, this is so bad. Walk me through this. Why would the husband go through with it beyond what we just said, beyond the idea of she got killed in this, let's have something come out of it? I mean, you've yeah, got I, the man who killed her in the lead role. I think there was. I think there was a pitch. I think there was a pitch. I think he was sold something. He was sold a bill of goods. Whether that was, uh, and I don't know what his motivations are. I don't know him personally. I've not seen his interviews. I know. I know nothing about the husband uh, as an individual. Uh, stick to the legal part of this case, not in terms sure, of sure. Uh, bringing in people who aren't directly involved, and particularly um, the victim's family. That, that's often people that you want to leave alone. You want to let them grieve. You want to let them go what they're going through. Uh, but there's multiple motivations. One of them could be monetary. I mean, they could have offered all of the money to go towards him and Halna. Maybe that's part of the wrongful death suit. Is that any proceeds of this are going to go towards that? Uh, that's possible. Um, maybe it is just like you said, the magnum opus. This is, you know, Halna's final film. We're going to put her name all over this. Uh, you know, it's going to be something that's going to really have her her name out there forever. Um, and obviously indemnification and saying that he's not liable, um, but having to be around Baldwin, who could be a convicted felon um, yeah. by the state, a criminal uh, for this death, it, it's it turns my stomach to think of that, to think that he would be on the same set sitting next to the person who killed his wife. All right, Andrew, so let's get into that then. The idea of a convicted felon on the set for many mm -hmm. people listening, they might think that if you're a convicted felon, that means that you're somewhere else and it's not in the deserts of New Mexico unless it's behind bars in the deserts of New Mexico. So tell us how much trouble is Mr. Baldwin in and what is the likely outcome or, or, or maybe the likely outcomes of this situation? So let's be clear that the charge can carry 18 months in prison. You could be in it theoretically on paper, on paper, he could be in prison for 18 months. Do I believe he will go to prison for 18 months? Absolutely not. Now, let me, it's easiest to understand the trial is two parts. One, are they guilty or innocent? That's the job of the jury. The jury is going to decide that. Are they guilty or innocent? Then there's a second part. Sometimes decided by the jury, sometimes decided by the judge. But that is sentencing. How long are they going to go to jail if they're guilty or innocent? So even if he goes to jail, uh, sorry, even if he goes to, to court, which is a big if, and I'll get into that in a second, even if he goes to court, even if he's found guilty, they could sentence him to three months, four months, five months, sure. six months, or they could sentence him to a couple days. Um, we do not know, but it could be a very, very short sentence. That sentence itself, when it says up to 18 months, that does not mean he's, they're required to give 18 months. They can give anything less than that, even a day. Um, there's also a fine attached to this. They could just fine it. Um, that's also perfectly permissible under the sentencing uh, structure uh, in New Mexico. However, okay, so okay, pause right there though. Okay. So if he is fined, is the fine is it given a range that's acceptable for the charging protocols, yes. or is it based on a percentage of one's wealth or their uh, holdings? There's a limit, I believe, and I would have to double check. I believe the limit on this one is five thousand dollars. Okay, so that's, uh, so a regressive, is, that's a regressive penalty against the poor then. And he would basically, if that were determined, he would basically walk scot-free. Yes, uh, I'm very glad you identified that as regressive against the poor. Yes, this is pretty much targeted at your everyday criminal. But for Alec Baldwin, he laughs at $5,000. Uh, that is that's a, that is a joke to him. But that is the cap under the statute, the maximum fine. So he could be hit with a $5,000 fine, and that could theoretically be it. Um, and... That would be nothing for him. Uh, but even more than that, even less than that, is what I think is most likely, which is a plea deal. He would plead guilty. 
I say, I did it, or plea no contest. In exchange, he would receive most likely probation. And if individuals know probation, that is he walks scot-free. He is under you know court, uh, court or rather judicial supervision. Uh, when you're on probation, you got to check in with your probation officer, whether that's a call, whether it's a stop in, a visit, whatever. He would be on probation, but be allowed to go about his business. And why this is likely, why I think that's very likely is there was a situation involving a, uh, I believe a 2014 shooting on set in a different part of the country. I believe it was in Georgia. And they received a plea offer, a plea deal, and only served six months probation. That was it in that case. But so I think that, that Bald- because that's in a separate state, that would not necessarily create precedence for New Mexico, correct? Correct. It is not legally binding, but because this is so rare and judges are just like me and you, they're just human sure. beings, they get on Google, they see, hey, where has this come up in other places? Where has this come up in other jurisdictions? How have they dealt with it? How have other judges dealt with this? And they would certainly see that case. It's very high profile. Uh, these shootings on movie sets are rare. And certainly they wouldn't want to give out something or give out a uh, punishment that was far in excess of what was seen in the past. So even though okay, it's Andrew, not binding, it's so, persuasive. So then is this the only charge that Mr. Baldwin faces? This is the only charge that he faces criminally, right? You can He obviously settled the wrongful death suit. Um, but criminally, this is the only one he faces. Hannah Gutierrez Reed. Also That's where faces I was going. I'm all, I'm curious about her now because this really gets into some of the double standards we see. Okay, she definitely has less resources for her defense. Yes. What What does doubt. she probably face in comparison to Mr. Baldwin? And will the result will the result that he faces impact how she will be? Uh, uh, punished for this situation, should she be found guilty in order for the court not to look as if they assisted a man who has great wealth and, uh, you know, threw away a, a young woman who does not have the means by which to defend herself in the same way? I, I don't think they're going to look at it that way. They can frame this in a way to put a lot of blame on the armorer. And I think they already had. In fact, a lot of the media I saw in the beginning, WW, is, um, I saw a lot of folks talking about the armor, the armor, it's her duty, it's her job, it's this and that. She wasn't in the room. It was her job description. Certainly it was her job. She wasn't in the room at the time. Now, it may have been negligent of her not to be in the room at the time. I think she should have been in the room at the time. That's what goes into the analysis here. If that negligence led down the causal chain, right, but for her negligence, would this have happened? If they can prove that to a jury, Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, the armor, will be guilty of her crime. But she's in a different scenario because she, her guilt is by her role, not because she did it, not because she pulled the trigger. But the question is for her, if she had done her job correctly, would this have happened? And that also applies to Baldwin as producer on set, right? So he's facing sort of a two-spectrum uh, uh, approach to this where he's he has that by his role and also the direct actions he took. Right, right. It's because of those actions coupled with the fact that he pulled the trigger. So he's got both. He's actually in a lot more trouble because of that immediacy because he pulled the trigger. However, it does seem, according to your analysis, that the most likely scenario for all of this is that despite a woman being dead, I mean, Mm -hmm. the most heinous of things that can occur, he killed a woman, I mean, he may not have meant to, but he killed her. It happens. He may it's walk fact. away with a with a fee and a plea deal that has him serve no jail time, which to me seems like the absolute highest level of privilege that any person could have, that they can kill someone and walk away from it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's exactly what could happen. He could walk away from this relatively relatively scot-free, particularly, like you said, compared to Hannah Gutierrez-Reed coming up, doesn't have a lot of money. You know, this was her first job. Her career is dead. Baldwin, I mean, frankly, we know pro. He's going to be embraced by Hollywood. He's going to go on to do many other films. For Hannah, her career is going to be ended by this. It is a tale of two charges um, when you see Hannah contrasted to Baldwin. Now, what I'm very interested in is that You and I had scheduled this conversation prior to new stuff that came out in the last 36 hours. 
Yes. And the stuff that came out is in regards to another celebrity. And why this interests me is because it seems to me that there may be a significant difference in how this individual is being treated, both legally as well as in the public eye, the coverage of the media, et cetera. And I don't necessarily understand it. And so I want you to help me in the audience understand this sure. better. Now, what I'm talking about is Justin Roiland, who is behind the, uh, the show, the super popular show, Rick and Morty. He's the co-creator with Dan Harmon. He's the voice actor that does like half the cast. He's also he's uh, Rick and Morty. I mean, so that, that's just because he's the, the titular characters. He is both of the titular characters in Rick and Morty. Right. He's Mr. Meeseeks. He's Mr. PBH. He's all these different characters. And he also was involved in many, many other shows. Um, and all of a sudden there was a cascading uh, domino effect of companies separating themselves from him, terminating all of their contracts with him. And it happened very rapidly something that we didn't necessarily see when Mr. Baldwin shot and killed a woman. So mm -hmm. I want us to, we're going to go through this and I, I want to tell the audience that we are both aware that there's some really spicy stuff out there about Justin Roiland. We know that there's, there are alleged things. We've seen them, we know about them, but we're not going to go into them specifically because guess what? We don't want to be in a situation where we do this video and two hours later we find out that one of those things was doctored or one of those things has a completely different story related to it. That happens all the time on the internet. So we can't jump into those things that are not assured. The things that we can talk about are these official charges. And so let's get straight into that. This is out of NBC News and uh, it's called Adult Swim, cuts ties with Justin Roiland following domestic abuse allegations. By the way, this would be followed up later on after this art article came out by his own video game company cutting ties with him and Hulu, which is owned by Disney. Well, so at least pretty much owned by Disney. It seems like pro all of his economic ties have been severed at this point. Um, and to me, what the most interesting thing is, especially as a lawyer, is how did they do that? Because there's been a lot of scandals like this. Um, I even remember talking with someone in Korea who was a fan of the, I believe it's the Try Guys. And one of those guys had an affair uh, and got cut out. And whenever you're cutting somebody out of a property that they have an interest in, um, you know, the, the, the interesting thing to me as a lawyer, which is very nerdy, it's a look at what that agreement said. And I guarantee you they would have had to pay him on the way out. There's no way they could have without a criminal charge in the bank. Because let's be very clear, Justin Rowland is guilty of zero crimes right now. Under our system of government, Justin Rowland is innocent until proven guilty. He has not been proven guilty in a court of law. So because of that, I believe that any contract which would have been violated, which would have been broken, which would have been severed, they would have had to pay him out. I think they would have had to give him something uh, to sever. Well, I know so, so you make a great point. Yeah. But here's what's odd about that. How did they, how did all of these companies, these are three completely independent companies. How right. did they all manage to, to do that so quickly within hours of each other? That's bizarre. How independent do you think they are, bro? <laughs> I want to hear Welcome to the conspiracy. Opinion. Welcome yeah. to the matrix. <laughs> Welcome to the matrix of entertainment corruption, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. All right, so let's read the article, and we're going to dive into all of this because I, I've got lots of questions. This is by uh, Doha Madani and Kat Tinbarge. Eh, we'll guess. Oh, all and that, there's a red right there. I want to say real quick. Kat Tenbarge is a red flag on anything she touches. She was an Amber Heard stan, an Amber Heard super fan during the Amber Heard trial and still to this day defends Amber Heard. So whenever I see her on there, I immediately throw up a red flag. 100%. Well, let, it, let it also be said that when we're talking about Mr. Justin Roiland right now, that he is engaged with a particular company that also is highly engaged with Ezra Miller and with Amber Heard and yet has not severed ties with those two individuals. And it seems to me that there's far more evidence. Now this could change, right? We, we know this right. can change. It can change. But, but there's far more evidence against those two individuals at this point, and yet they haven't severed ties. So that's where I want to really find out what the heck's going on. Let's get into it. Adult Swim announced Tuesday that it has cut ties with Justin Rowland, star and co-creator of the animated comedy series, Rick and Morty. And this is key, everybody, faces felony domestic violence charges. We'll get back to that. The Cable Channel retweeted a statement from the official Rick and Morty Twitter account, which what a way to announce it. Yeah, on the official <laughs> Twitter. You know, it's a spit Retweet a cartoon statement. <laughs> uh, 
uh, but that it intends to continue with the show's seventh season, but that it has ended its association with Justin Roiland. Uh, and then it goes on to talk about just how uh, intertwined he is with that show. And it says Squanch Video Games, the video game company co-founded by him, also did the same, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now, here's the key thing. If we drop down, and this is this is what's so fascinating to me. First of all, uh, he pleaded not guilty in 2020 to this. And the attorney for him, T. Edward Welburn, said, we look forward to clearing Justin's name and helping him move forward as swiftly as possible. Uh, I think later on he talked about how they think this will be dismissed completely. So here's my question. These companies then had to have known about this for years. Oh, yes. For years. So what changed in the last 48 hours, let's say? Let's give them a buffer where they had some time to make to, to make these decisions before they went public. What what happened? Andrew, what's going on here? So, I, I mean, I think we're also, we're coming up towards the trial. Um, so there's a lot of things that could be going on. Maybe they all, uh, they found out a piece of evidence that could be particularly serious. That's one theory. Or they just talked about it and said, hey, we're all going to do this. We're going to do it at the same time. We're going to all sever, sever ties with them. We're going to use this up all as an opportunity to, uh, to bring that out and to do that. Um, but it makes it seem, because of the timing, it makes him seem like he's guilty. But at this point, to be clear, we've seen nothing in court. And I am very strong on innocent until proven guilty. Nobody has done anything. They're completely absolved under the law, under the, our system of justice, until they go to court. Um, so the fact that it happened right now, it's weird. It's too coincidental. Yes, there could have been a piece of evidence that they saw. Yes, it could be something legitimate. But it could also be... Uh, a coordinated move where enough players that had chips on the table said, hey, we all want to take these off the table, right? Let's get together. Let's do this at the same time. All right. So let's walk through this innocent until guilty thing because it's, I mean, well, it's primal to our society, first of all. Yes. But I, I, I find it very fascinating because in the case of Alec Baldwin, yes, you presume innocence until, until guilt is shown or, or decided upon. However, I mean, there's a dead woman. So something yes. happened in the case yes. of, of this. Well, we've got a Jane Doe and we, we, we've got some allegations, but they're nebulous, right? They're not, right. We, we don't have specificity at this time. So mm -hmm. walk us through a few of these steps with your uh, legal expertise. First of all, yep. this is, these are being called felony, uh, domestic. What was it? Domestic battery. Is that what it is? Yeah. There's, there's two separate charges against him under the California penal code. One is uh, corporal injury. Um, to a uh, uh, it's domestic corporal injury, so corporal injury to a spouse, cohabitant, it could be a parent, right? Um, and that has three elements. Uh, reading those, it's that the defendant intentionally and unlawfully inflicted a physical injury uh, on a spouse, cohabitant, or parent. Okay, to, pause, pause for a minute, pause for a minute, okay, though. Go ahead. Help us out with this. So, we, we get the injury, okay. yes. How significant does the injury have to be in order for it to be classified as a felony? Or does number that come two. into any? Okay, there we go. Element number two. There's three elements. So the first <laughs> is there's an injury, right? Good, good. You actually predicted this, pro. This shows your sharp. Thank you. Here. So first is go the past the bar here in just a moment, folks. Seriously, he's ready. He's ready, guys. We're gonna send him in. Um, uh, you could definitely help these guys out. I'll tell you that. Um, intentionally and unlawfully. So that's step one. Intentionally and unlawfully inflicted an injury. Number two. It needs to result in a traumatic condition. A traumatic okay. condition. Okay, whoa, whoa, help me out, help me out. I may go, be right, going to step three. Right. Is that traumatic in terms of physical damage, mental damage, emotional damage, or what? So it is typically a physical injury, so a wound or bodily injury, whether minor or serious, caused by the direct use of physical force. So Okay, so here's what, here's what stumps me on this. Here's what stumps yes. me on this, and this is why this is so nebulous to me. Tell me if I'm wrong, because again, we're in felony territory, not misdemeanor territory. Yep. And we're, cer we're certainly not in petty offenses, but yes, this could be anything from a very light contusion on, uh, on a shoulder all the way up mm -hmm. to, he has knocked her teeth out of her mouth. Yes. And yes. anything in between there. So this is, a, this is a, an incredible spectrum. This could be a paper cut all the way, you know, up to uh, severe crippling injuries. Okay, so um, what separates this from a misdemeanor then of the same type? Because it, the 
first of all, uh, in many states, and I'm not a California lawyer, right? I haven't passed the California bar, just the Florida bar. But in many different states, just knowing generally from generally looking at different information in different states, um, domestic crimes are treated with a higher level of scrutiny. So the same situation which might, in a barroom brawl, uh, end up uh, as a misdemeanor would typically end up as a felony if it involves a spouse or someone else because it's perceived that society wants to disincentivize those sort of crimes. So, so this be could clear, be a the, default. This could default into felony just by the individuals involved. Right. I mean, if, the, if this was not a spouse, cohabitant, or parent, this could be a misdemeanor. Um, it's possible uh, that this could be charged as a misdemeanor rather than a felony. Okay, uh, so again, for everybody they, to understand, We've got a yes. spectrum here of paper cut all the way up to you beat the absolute living daylights out of another individual to the point of near death. And by the way, the, the third element, because there are three, is that it cannot be a self-defense scenario. So okay. if there was a self-defense scenario, that would negate uh, this uh, particular situation. So, All right. Charge uh, number two he has, which is also a felony. What is it? Yes. It is false imprisonment, so or specifically false imprisonment by menace, violence, fraud, or deceit. False imprisonment is essentially just generally a deprivation of your liberty. So if someone, you know, would to keep you in a room for a while, um, that could be false imprisonment. Or even, let's say, if they were to threaten you. Um, that's why they bring in uh, the statute says by menace, violence, fraud, or deceit. So if there was any sort of threats they can prove, any sort of fraud they can prove that he committed uh, that deprived her of liberty, of freedom, uh, he could be guilty of uh, false imprisonment. By And again, the spectrum here is, well, it's an understatement to say broad. So we could yes. be dealing with a situation where she wanted out of a car and he wouldn't let her yes, because he, he didn't want to stop and let her off on the side of the road. Or it could go all the way up to he's been holding her in his uh, his basement for a month, anywhere in between, right? Yes. So the the elements are you know four elements to walk through: intentionally restrained, detained, or confined another person. That's one. So you have to have intent. Number two, you made them stay or go somewhere for a period of time, even if it's a minute, right? Even if it's a minute, you made them do the thing for a period of time. Uh, three, they did not give their consent and were harmed. And four, the conduct was a significant, i.e. The, fa the false imprisonment, was a significant factor in causing the, uh, the harm. Um, and that harm is a broad harm. So that harm could be a um, non-physical harm. All right. So I don't have any personal knowledge as to whether any of this is true. And I don't have any specifics as to what either of these charges is dealing with beyond this incredible spectrum that we've just discussed. Is that your same situation? I am exactly in that situation. I, and I am, I am in that situation, um, you know, because I haven't done that research yet, but even if I did, even if I knew what their allegations were, even if I'd, uh, you know, really looked into all of the details of these two, of these two charges of these two felonies that are levied against, uh, Justin Rowland, I, I would still say these are strong allegations that need to be proven at court because remember both of these require intent on his part intent, mens rea, state of mind. They've got to have a jury convinced that he is actually intending to do the thing. And that's typically very hard to prove. It's very hard to prove intent. That's why for our friend Alec Baldwin, uh, they charged him with negligent manslaughter, i.e. involuntary manslaughter, which does not require a state or an intent of mind. So let's say right up front before we continue any farther, we don't, we don't know what happened at all. At and all. And, and these, these charges are so big that it could go in such vastly different directions that there's, they're almost meaningless to us other than that they are legal charges. But in terms yes. of what actually occurred, they're essentially meaningless because we have no specificity as to the actions that led to this. So we're not saying in this video that, that this woman is out of her mind. We're not saying that these are false charges and we're not saying that they're trumped up or anything like that. Yes. We're also not saying that Justin Roiland is a horrible person who beat the living daylights out of and incarcerated a woman. We're not saying anything because we have no idea. And we're not going to instantly jump in one direction or the other and be prejudiced either way. That's not going to happen. Enough of that crap where we've decided that instantly we're going to believe either side because we have some sort of uh, preference for believing one type of individual or another. 
Is that, is that fair, Andrew? That's exactly the point I take. And I, I mean, more more often than not, I have to push back with the mainstream. I usually have to push back against uh, the Me Too type movement, you know, which is accepting, you know, believe all women, believe all accusations, you know, be, you know, believe them, merit them, you know, consider them as truthful. Um, I have to push back against that typically because that's the mainstream media outlet. But I also push back against the assertion that he didn't do it. Everybody that's did exactly all right. All crimes, pro, this is my stance, all crimes deserve proper investigation and going through the court process. And if he is guilty, he deserves to go away. But if he is innocent, he deserves to be exonerated. And also, here's the other thing too, pro, people should be very careful about what they're saying because people, especially nowadays, are getting really, really, really courageous uh, and making statements out there that can be potentially defamatory. If people go out there, which I'm not saying, but there are people out there that will say, Justin Rowland is a felon. That is potentially defamation. If he is ultimately innocent and he proves that he is innocent of that, and they're making these statements that he is a thing that he's not, that he is, for example, in the Amber Heard case where Amber said Johnny was a wife beater, right? Johnny was a domestic abuser and made those statements uh, via the Washington Post. Um, that was found to be defamation. I think people need to be very careful when they're making these statements before this has gone to trial. Absolutely. And let it be said as well that if we find out that he was abusive to a woman in these in the ways that have been defined, and especially if they are uh, significant, then all condemnation to him. Likewise, yes. if we find out that this is an absolute nothing burger, and that either the woman has uh, uh, trumped all this stuff up, or if the district attorney that's bringing this is bringing it uh, in order to have a moment in the spotlight, then condemnation to anybody who would do such a thing. However, right. here's what I'm really interested in. With Alec Baldwin, and, and by the way, has Alec Baldwin even been arrested at this point? He's been charged. Has he even had to turn himself in at all? No, I, I think he had to report to police. Uh, you know, he probably was released. You know, released. Uh, I don't think there's any going to be any bail for him. I don't think it's there's no be a there's situation. no uh, there's no booking photo. There's none of that, right? No mugshot. No, not yet. No, and I, I think that's not going to happen. I don't think you're going to get it's, the Alec Baldwin mugshot. It's nice mug to be shot. privileged. Yes, it's, nice. it's very it's nice, nice to have right? privilege. Yeah, yes. they'll, they'll it's tell nice us to, all about how the rest of us are privileged later. It's nice for the cops to take their due time to decide whether they want to charge I, you rather than just throwing you in jail and holding you till they figure it out. Right. But that didn't happen for Mr. Roiland in terms of the public perception. So here's my question. We've got Alec Baldwin. He was not arrested. He, well, you know, not in the normal way, no mugshot, none of that. He got to go on and do national interviews. And one of the likely scenarios is that he gets to walk free, essentially, maybe mm -hmm. probation, maybe pays a, a fee that as a percentage of his overall wealth is completely and utterly negligible. It would be like you or I going to buy a diet soda tomorrow. And then we've got Justin Roiland, who has been completely severed of so many of these, these contracts that provide him with his, his uh, income. But also on the legal side, my question is, how many years in prison and how much trouble does Mr. Roiland face? Again, Alec Baldwin, a woman is dead. Justin Roiland, as far as we know, there's nobody dead. What does he face? Right. Um, well, first of all, these are felony charges. And, when, and I will say the similarity with Baldwin is obviously as a felon, you can have certain rights uh, rights taken away, right? rights to vote, um, certainly rights, uh, many states take away your rights to uh, own and possess firearms. So there's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of potential right there um, to, to see serious punishments for both of them. Uh, for Roland in particular, um, he would face serious time in prison. I haven't looked up the exact total number of years, but it would be it would be serious uh, time in prison, exceeding I guarantee you, exceeding Baldwin's term of eighteen months. Um, but beyond that, um, he would face he and he has faced complete severance from all of these of all of these positions to the point where he might need to borrow five thousand dollars. I Maybe mean, he can me, go work on the Rust set. Maybe Baldwin can hire him to fly out to New Mexico, and he can be the one who who handles the the, the firearms and the weapons. It's it, anything is possible at this point. Better than Hannah Gutierrez Reed, I'll tell you that. Um, oh, and I just found it out. Okay, apparently it's up to seven years in jail. Okay, uh, so he's, he's facing seven years in jail. Okay, nobody dead. Again, he may be heinous. He may have absolutely abused a woman in in horrible ways, and will condemn him to the utmost. Right? We'll condemn him to hell. But he's facing seven years. 
Baldwin, there's a woman who's dead, faces how many years? Uh, 18 months maximum, if he's Good. sentenced to the maximum. Can we say that there's a problem here in the disparity of these uh, these possible punishments? Yeah. Yeah, it is, it is, it is, it has been, and, and this is the politics of states like California. Um, they have made these, uh, these crimes even more strict. And also even in states, you'd be surprised, even in states that, uh, vote different ways than California, the quite opposite of California, the Texas's and Florida's, you'd be surprised, uh, the punishment for things like that versus, uh, taking someone's life. Uh, to me, the deprivation of your life is the ultimate deprivation of liberty. Sure, uh, you absolutely. Have no liberty How could it not if be? you're in the grave? Yeah, I mean, and, and so to me, it's a joke that someone's uh, that some, it's a sad joke, cruel joke that someone is now deceased, and um, we are, are are looking at a slap on the wrist for Baldwin, whereas Roland's career is completely ruined over allegations which we do not know yet know factually as of today today uh, January it's the 26 over here for me in Korea January 26 2023. I do not know whether Justin Rowland is guilty or innocent, but yet right, Andrew, the court of public opinion has decided. They've decided true, he's guilty. true or false. From the legal standpoint, there's a double standard here for for Baldwin versus Rowland. Absolutely, one hundred percent un uh, uncontroversial. Baldwin versus Rowland. Rowland is getting pilloried, while Baldwin is completely there's crickets. Mainstream media is not covering it. They are covering for him. True or false, in terms of Hollywood, the media, and the public eye, is there a disparity in the way these two men are being treated? True, 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 true. And particularly regarding Hollywood and the public eye, totally different. Court of public opinion, they're trying to push it on the Baldwin side. that He's innocent. He didn't know. He didn't have intent. They're pushing these false narratives, just like they pushed during the Rittenhouse case when they said he crossed state lines with a weapon, when they said that African-Americans were shot during that. They're pushing this narrative, which is false, which has nothing to do with the facts. That's what's going on on one side versus prejudging someone, Justin Rowland, who we do not know is guilty or innocent. So absolutely true that they're treating these completely differently. Well, I am convinced that we've proved the case here tonight. I didn't know where this was going to go. Honestly, we did not prejudge this. We just had a, a, an honest and free conversation to see where it would go. Andrew, final thoughts before we end this. Uh, share, share with everybody what you're thinking as we wrap it up and as also uh, where people can find you on this great, big, beautiful World Wide Web out there. Yes. Well, first of all, make sure you like and subscribe this video uh, with Pro. He's an amazing friend of mine. I'm glad to collaborate with him and look forward to working with him uh, on many videos as he races up in subscribers and in views here on YouTube. Uh, if he keeps being this fun, how could we not, right? <laughs> yeah, I love doing this. I, I love it. Absolutely. It's much It's much more fun. I love, my, I love my other work. I love my legal work, but this is a lot of fun for me, hanging out with you guys and hanging out with people like Pro. Um, but you can find me at Legal Mindset on YouTube and on Rumble, as well as legalmindset.locals.com, legalmindset.locals.com. That's my private community and the best place to connect with exclusive content uh, on my channel. But my final thoughts are, look, I think Baldwin will enter a plea here. I think he will admit to it. He will move on and they will make this production and we are all gonna stay focused on it and focused on the hypocrisy regarding Baldwin. Regarding Royland, um, I'm going to be covering that. I'm going to be staying very, very closely attuned to it. I'm going to go through the complaint as that's released. It will go through all the charges. Uh, the case, if it's televised, I will cover that case. I will stream that case on my channel. Um, but I think we've seen what Hollywood does to those they've decided are persona non grata. When they burn you, they burn you hard. They did it with Depp, they're doing it with Roland now. Now Roland may be guilty. He may be completely guilty and worthy of you know being pilloried, but that needs to wait for the trial, which should happen in August of this year. Any chance that the if Baldwin were to go to trial, would that be televised? That should be televised. I would love for that to be televised and absolutely yeah. You know, Millions of viewers to, going over to, to LawTube. <laughs> that would be insane. I mean, between that and the uh, Angelina Jolie, Brad Pitt winery dispute, uh, those might be the most televised events uh, ever. If they could. I'm telling you. Well, thank you so much for being here. Like you said, everybody make sure to click the like button, subscribe, share it out. 
and at that little notification bell down there, it's really fun. Click it and stick it to the algorithms, and uh, we will have to do this again. We hope you enjoyed this video. We hope that you learned a little bit, and as always, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are and whatever you are doing, keep having fun.